Oakland, California, 1966. Behind the racial upheavals in northern cities is the story of Negroes trapped in urban ghettos. In Oakland, more than one-third of the residents are Negro. They came to work in the defense industries around San Francisco Bay. But with the end of World War II, the jobs ended. The people, however, remained. And what began for many as an escape to jobs and freedom has ended in poverty amidst all the symbols of affluence. This documentary moves within the two overlapping worlds of the ghetto. The day-to-day -day physical reality and the world of dreams and fantasies of escape. It is a story of people caught in a lifelong struggle between their hopes and their abilities and their discovery that no matter how hard they try, they will be losing just the same. Cadillac, a home. My own home, my own home, and put my mother in while I'm on the road. And I would also come back to West Oakland and let them know that I did make it. In Harlem, they have uh, tenement houses. Uh, they have these big, uh, big buildings. But the same dirt, the same whores, the same bars, the same pawn shops, whiskey stores right here on 7th Street. Just the same thing. I grew up on 118th Street. It's 118th Street all over again. Anything the power structure wants, I don't want. Anything they don't want, I want it. Everybody need money. It's hard for them to grow up in the slums because they see so much action going on. I've had more trouble since I've been in West Oakland than I ever had. Study case S2614, Agnes Johns, recipient under the AFDC program, July 1966. Assessment of areas of functioning. Agnes Johns is the mother of 10 minor children. She is 34 years of age and is separated from her first spouse who deserted the home in 1960. Since arriving in Oakland from Louisiana, she has had three additional offspring. The monthly welfare budget is $392. The oldest child, Robert Lee Johns, is 17 and a half years of age. He stopped attending classes at McClyman's High School toward the end of his 11th year. School authorities doubt that he will re-enroll. He has a juvenile arrest record of three arrests dating from 1964. Robert's social personal functioning. Inside the family, he appears to perform adequately. His economic functioning is poor. Unable to find employment seems to be a We don't even allow people to talk to us and use the word slum anymore, um, or ghetto, because we feel that this has been a stigmata. And um, we say that uh, it is an older section, an older historic section of Oakland. Yeah, 
artist's name is Slum Street in Slum, West Oakland. And uh, we don't uh, have that uh, name as, as they have all given us as the slum area because we have nice homes in, in this area and we have uh, intelligent people. We have people with, with uh, uh, middle uh, income and we don't have all people as they state as on uh, welfare. Nobody wants you when you when you have children, especially many children as I have. Well, I'm so mm -hmm. you crazy to get it between West Oakland and um, Louisiana, it's not very much different because Louisiana, the only thing you have to say yes sir and no sir back there, but the living is is just not any different. I'd rather say yes and no sir and uh, live comfortable than to live in the slums and you can say yes and no. It really, uh, it really disturbs me when I hear my people calling uh, what's up in ghetto and slums and so on. And, and I've lived around here for 45 years. And I've traveled quite extensively, but I've never found any slums in West Oakland. <laughs> enforces uh, the law to keep up property. But they didn't bother with West Oakland because they knew that people that used to live in West Oakland had, had moved out. And they let Oak, Oakland run, run down because they knew someday they were going to come back and they were going to come back and take this property from and run us out. We'd like to call the bandstand Curtis Baker, Black Jesus. I did not name myself Black Jesus. This was did by poor people who, who that I have helped. I am black. I think I have much pride and dignity. I think I have much self-control. We know we got white bigots, atheists, hypocrites. We got white dogs who have never did anything for us. Curtis Baker's on the front page again. 
with his private poverty program. But we get all of the publicity to individuals who are at the edge where they are threatening something all the time. But solid, constructive work such as being as is being done by the block leaders rarely gets any publicity. We can represent black power. We need it. What is black power? Mr. Joe Sinker. That's Mr. Joe, the bartender. What's black power? Joe, black power means that black people will lead their own problems. Black people will drive their own cars. But Joe, I'm going to answer if you give me time, baby. Well, Joe, black power means that we are tired of the white people driving, getting in the front seat, driving out of a car, and we sit in the back. And when it breaks down, and when it breaks down, Joe, then they say we break it down. You know why you're dangerous? You're dangerous because you're constantly preaching black power, black supremacy. Well, Joe, I don't know. Are you going to kill all the whiteies? Well, Joe, black power means this, Joe. If I have to kill all whiteies, Joe, to in, in all the way I can get freedom, Joe, I'm willing to do this, well, Joe. No, no, you can manage it. That's okay, Johnny. That's okay. Let him, let him go, Johnny. It's, it's a very... And Joe, let him, let the French of a man talk. You're so ignorant that this man is exploiting you. Don't say that out loud, because you're the one... That's your prerogative. He's exploiting you. Well, I have been listening to you too long tonight. That's why I am. Damn fool. Turn him loose. Turn him loose. I'll break up the whole gun. Call him. Break it. Billy. And you're going to go. You're going to go. Kenny's in trouble. Kenny's in trouble. Oh, he shoots another to the chest. He's in trouble. Kenny's in trouble, ladies and gentlemen. He's in very much trouble if he don't fight back. Oh, oh, the shoot one to the short rib. Kenny runs him up against the wall. Shoot to the midsection. He was one to the arm, one to the short rib. Shoot mighty like, oh, the shoot hard to the chest. It is very painful. Kenny, one to the jaw. Short rib to the jaw. Oh, the shoot one to the chest. Kenny went two back. To the rib, to the rib. Oh, the shoot one to the rib. Oh, the one to the short rib. Back again. Oh, the shit. The towel tied up. Tied up, ladies. Both boys are tired of What you gonna do tonight? We need some soap to wash your own. Monsieur, what you gonna do tonight when your hair falls over your eyes? Long time I get home. Don't let it know. <laughs> oh, where could my devil be? Oh, where could be? I told him if he wanted to get to be a nice young man, he have his hair trimmed low, get him a job and buy him some nice clothes, he can go to mostly any kind of employment office and try to find him a job. Go out and catch you a girlfriend. Oh. Okay? Yeah. If you don't catch a girlfriend, I do it over free for you. <laughs> <laughs> he said it makes no difference about your hair. But I think it does make a difference. With the people that's going to hire you. If I heard this on the radio about they wouldn't hire boys with these long hair with the processes on their head. Which one? Oh, the back cage. Oh, the back cage, huh? The back cage. Blah. Blah. Gets up in the morning, call me, lay down, call me. Nowadays, when they, speaking of processing, years ago it was known as uh, conch, conchaline. And this was done by lye, a 
strong washing soap and eggs. And it was put on your head. It was uh, what we call take the kinks out and give you that, uh, that straight hair appearance. And then we'd slick it down with uh, some heavy grease. And at that time, it was called, uh, I believe it was uh, Murray's, Murray's hair, Murray, Murray's hair preparation or something like that. And now as it uh, got refined, they have a better chemical that they put in. And it doesn't leave sores in your hair like it used to do. Because years ago, it used to come up with big sores if you left it in your hair too long. And all your hair would fall out. But now, they have this refined process that they use. And the fellas uh, straighten your hair. And they put on, uh, go into the dryer. They sit on the dryers. And this dries their hair to, to the waves that the barber has put in there with his finger, what they call finger waving. But you see, most of the kids today, they like this idea of having uh, uh, processing. The reason I stopped processing, uh, it seemed to me that it just came to me overnight. I took pride in race. And I wanted to identify with uh, being a Negro. I didn't want to be something other than what I was really supposed to be. Now they're doing it more to identify uh, with being an entertainer or, uh, or a hustler. That gives them that appearance of uh, uh, being slick, you know, wise. Uh, uh, to have a process now, you, you, more, you more readily identify a man with a process now uh, as a hustler. <laughs> Well, you were to try to make something money yourself before. It's too late. But the next day, it seemed like the same old dull day, nothing to do. It's just like uh, my dad used to tell me. He says, if you have dreams and you never realize one of them during your lifetime, then you've lost. You lose out. So you get a, start making false dreams, false plans. One day you're going to be a, maybe you're going to be a big pimp. See, we never thought in, that we are going to be a big school teacher or a doctor or a lawyer. We used to think in the, the lines of hustling. We're going to be a good hustler. We're going to be a good thief. Uh, I see myself as an average, everyday American boy, trying to make it like everybody else, trying to beat somebody out of something, somebody trying to beat me out of something. Man. You feel like kind of empty, and you wasted all your time, all this time, when you could have had you a job, you know, and spending money, every, coming, coming to school every day, spending useless lunch money, just coming to school, eating, going back home. Just like going to a big party, a silent party where everybody be quiet and pretend they're working and everything. I'm gonna I'm get me a car. I'm gonna get me some money, give my mother some.
Get up off a little while and help Mama some. I've been let down a couple times, and when you be when you get let down two or three times, you feel that out. I'm just. I'm just afraid. I'm just getting, I'm afraid of being let down again. I was let down the first time. Those are looking pretty good. My husband left me with, stuck with seven children. And I never heard from him again in seven years. So when he left, I had no job or nothing, no attorney to how to make a living for these kids. So I left and came to California and went to the employment office. And they sent me to work. Me and Mrs. got good. <laughs> After we got good, we started living together. And every, when he got angry with me, he'd move all this stuff out of the house and part of mine. And this last time, he didn't leave me nothing in the house. I had to go from scratch. So I just, I've been let out and I just don't know how to go around and get me someone else. I would like to find a man that's going to be interested in my children and interested in me too. And help me keep the kids from school. And this is the kind of man I'd want. I dream about the time that I would see my kids walking across the floor graduating and then they would go to college. No man is an island. At one time or another, all of us are faced with the question, should I hate my transgressors or forgive them? If we forgive them, we can go on living with them. But if we begin or continue hating them, we cannot live with them and therefore must draw ourselves delete, thus forming an island.
well, I wish I could see Robert walking with one of those long robes on and one of those graduation caps. I'd have felt so proud to see him. I would like for Robert to be a lawyer, if possible. And I'd like for Otis to be an electrician. And Ramona, I would like for her to play a piano. And Shirley, I would like for her to be a teacher. And I would say Michael, I would also like for him to be a teacher. And Druil, she wants to be a nurse. send me reports on uh, Robert at all times that he didn't come to school and I went to Mr. Hargraves and I talked with him. We have several youngsters like Robert in our school. Uh, youngsters who, youngsters who really want, really feel that they want to receive a high school diploma, but who have so many deficiencies, not only academic deficiencies, but uh, a lack of self-discipline that they really don't know how to go about uh, doing that. I would show these things to him and recommend that he did go to school because I wanted him to finish, you know. So Robert said there was no need of him going uh, the semester out because he felt like if if he would uh, stop and get him a job and do, he'd be prepared to go to the next section. You know, I'm, I'm sure Robert, like most of the youngsters, want a job. Someone would have to give him a job. If you're going to send him down somewhere to apply, to fill out the application form, and make and to apply, and to meet certain criteria, you can forget about it. I think someone needs to give him a job and say, I believe in you. I think you can do this. Hold his hand, if necessary. Watch him. Tell him he has to produce on the job and everything else. Uh, and I think he'll, he'll be on his way. I, I really feel that with a youngster like Robert, uh, his chances of finishing school under the normal procedure of going to school for six periods every day without anything else, I don't think he's going to do it this way. This is Robert Johns. Robert, this is Miss Milby from the Youth Employment Service. There's a job open for a young man. Pencil and paper, just a minute.
I feel afraid I'm gonna make it sometime. Father, he used to change cars almost every two months. He had, um, the best car that he had, it was a, it had just came out, it was a Mercury. A 57, 59, 57, 56 Mercury. And it was out of sight. But he traded that in for some other old junk. We first we moved from the country to town, then we moved from the town back to the country. We got in the country. And uh, we could run wild as we, if we wanted to, and we'd go barefoot it. Now these people out here, they go barefoot it, but it hurt their feet. Oakland looked just like any other place to me that I see in pictures and things. When I, when I was in Louisiana, they used to always say California was rich and everything, you know. Everybody was rich, having a good time, you know, a ball every night. You didn't have to work hard and make good money. I came out here, and they was living just like everybody else was. Not no different, no 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 better, no worse. If it don't pay for the dime and quarter, I ain't gonna take it. Picked up for suspicion of battery. Oh. Yeah, but I didn't do it, you know, and they let me go. Uh-huh. Uh, so your your job will be uh, to sweep the factory after after the plant closes at 4:30 in the afternoon to sweep this area out to put all the scraps in uh, big boxes and run them down the freight elevator to the alley. Keep the two laboratories here, the men's and women's laboratories, clean. The job pays a, a dollar and a half an hour. That's an eight-hour day, buck and a half. Uh, okay, well, let's uh, 
uh, plan on coming here next Monday at 9 o'clock, and we'll get started. Ever seen a knitting machine? No, I've never seen one. I didn't know it was, I didn't know it was such thing as a knitting machine. That's how, it's, a, it's the same way your socks are made. So we'll see you, uh, we'll see you next Monday at 9 o'clock. Stuff. Let's make it, you know. That's it. Look at it. Just look. Now I'm lost without it, huh? They calls me Mo Monitor Sand Robert actually to work and to do uh to keep me at home. Yeah, I've talked to him a couple of times about this. Uh, I told him I was spending more money on him than he really was making, you know. And I couldn't see no good that he was doing to help me in the home. So I didn't see no reason why that he shouldn't quit. But he still want to go on and work. Well, he said he was going to try to get part-time and go to school part-time. But well, as I see, he'll be losing just the same if he do this. My mother, she always fussing and fussing. I'd just be glad to get out the house and walk. She just be worried a lot. She she can't. She don't mean to holler or nothing like that. But it gets me, burns me up. Then when I come in, sometimes she be telling me I've been drinking. I had never, I ain't had nothing, and I don't be drinking nothing. I mess with no dope and nothing no more. Just think all of me. She got ten kids and she been doing that ever since for a long time. That's how come I got to make something out of myself. I'm going back to school and make something out of myself so I can take care of her. feel lousy. Because whenever I'm going down there, I never have enough money to, to get what I really would want. My nerves are already bad. Because I feel like they think I'm trying to steal something. And I never sold anything in my life. And I often wonder why they feel like us Negroes are going to store and steal something. They don't do most white people like that. I see them get their clothes in their arms and walk all around in the store and it don't bother them. But when I go in the store, they'll tell me they'll take this until I come to the checkout place to pay for it. Robert. He always mama. He was mama's baby. When he was born, I brought him with these overall suits. And I thought it was so cute on a little baby.
I used to be looking all right. Uh, I went down so much. I used to have hips. Now I went down so bad. Really. Mm. They always tell me I could pick up me some extra money. Quite a few go out and pick up them something. I think I think a woman is low enough herself when she get out on the streets and do a thing like that. I feel like if she have a personal man, um, maybe she got two. Uh, it might be fine. If she's a woman that got children, he knows she needs something. Yeah. And he feel like he should give her something. A dollar. Some of them like to do it, some of them don't like to work. And in another way, some of them just think it make them look nice to do this. And one to, one, the, the reason why I realize people don't work if I don't get enough money. And they goes out and they what you call it, turn these little things and and get if they don't get but five dollars, they feel like they can buy a little food with that or something like that. But I don't feel like uh, that I would put myself in that position. I would want this public well, for nothing on earth. Will the meeting please come to order? The we secretary will to... read the minutes of the last meeting, please. July the 25th, 1966. 18 <coughs> present. The meeting was held at Mrs. Ballard's home, 1503 Magnolia Street. Meeting open. Minutes read and approved. Mrs. Minneweather reported a riot. Um, started on Chestnut Street last Thursday evening. The block leaders reported to the police and a crowd yelling, Let's have another walk, walk. Were dispersed by members of Oak Center before the police got there. Mr. Bell reported undesirable tenants moved on the block. Notified police retrieved a gun and purse and gave to police. Leave you. I go to work and and make money and then I don't see where it go or where it was or where it went or nothing. And I, uh, I quit my girlfriend. I just been snapping at people lately, just mad about my, about that and myself and everything else, you know. And I'm getting tired of not having no money in my pocket, you know. And my brother don't even work and he have a little money in his pocket. About Six years from the day, you can look back and, and say I told you the truth, that I was going to be something to make something of myself. Money. That's what everybody needs, money. No, I'm not going on my television. I wish I could call back to be a little girl. I'd put every day of my life in school that school was going on. Get me a little job, and wouldn't have to look up for nobody. I feel like I should get this running away and just go leave them. Although I know I wouldn't get far. Sometimes I feel like I should go to the bar and just sit there and just drink till I get happy. <laughs> That's about the only thing I see you do. All my life, I've been living in a fantasy, a dream world, lying to myself. This is the only way you can make it. You can't make it by uh, uh, just normally. I mean, you need something to hold on to. I dreamed I was a, a bull or something. It's like I was trying to get to someone. I was running. I was after someone, and I never could get this person. Seems like we was in a field, an open field, and I'd run them so till he would always put the dodge on me, and I couldn't get to him because he jumped the fence on me, and I couldn't make it. Then I woke up shaking, wondering, why did I have to be a bull? Oh. Were you? You were, you cheering. Please turn off the record player. I'm so tired. I want to go to sleep.
I was planning on going back to school and really making it in a good way, but I was going to be clean when I went to. I was going to learn everything I could, read everything I get my hand on. I read now, but I don't know enough. I got to find some way to give me some money. I don't like to steal nothing, but if I if this, if keep it on my mind, I'm going to get me some money some kind of way. And maybe if I get it, I'd be sorry I took it from whoever I took it from. But I'd be glad I got it. I'm not afraid to go to jail. When I make up in my mind to do something, I go do it. No second thoughts about it. I go do it. All I have to do is drink three or four bills, and I'll be able to do it. I don't know. I know it's gonna be something. It's, I know it. it. I don't think I know. It's a fact. It's a fact. The secret of a person's strength is identification with, while the most dangerous source of a person's weakness is alienation from life. The game of life is hard and must be played by all with everyone working together with patience and long-suffering. We are out to win because we are afraid of suffering eternally in the inferno. The opposite team is made up of only four players. Defeat the catcher, faith the field men, destiny the base men, and time the pitcher. It is a hard game and many strike out because they wait too long and are caught unprepared. Many pop out to fate and don't have a chance. I tell you what I do. I tear up some of them big stores, and uh, I would um, maybe loot while, while, you know, while you got a chance to get some at those big stores, you know. Get it, because they can always replace it, dude. And now, um, as far as I'm concerned, San Francisco should have had a ride a long time ago. It's been on the edge for a long time, and uh, people have been looking, looking for this, you know, and. Um, in Oakland, the same thing will occur. The police department called me about 3.30 this morning and told me they had picked up Robert. They told me he was setting fire around Rose Department store in Oakland. They had this made up before we even got here this morning. Because they don't have no evidence. I don't see why they should hold him up here like that. The boy that's keeping him out of school, they said he wanted to get ed he wanted him to get education. Now, how can he get education up here? Well, certainly, Robert had, had made every effort to uh, keep himself employed. And while he had dropped out of school for a while, he had uh, uh, re enrolled in school and was attending classes. Yes, he was. And really, by the police hitting him, I don't feel I don't feel right over that at all. I, I really want something to be done. I don't want to suspend him. I want him to pay for what he did to my son. We're going to register a protest regarding the police brutality. We're going to do everything we can on it. Let's go see Robert. Okay. Then. Yeah. Robert Lee John's mother. Yes, come on. Just a moment. And attorney. I'll have you in a moment. Robert, very, very concerned about being held over, and uh, I think that we should encourage him. To... That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to do uh, not to cry. The only thing they're holding me on right now is what that witness said, you know. 
That's the witness word against my word, you know. So I guess they'll take the witness word, you know. I don't see what I was behind this other boy that was pouring this stuff when I came up the street, you know. They asked me, was he with him? And I just said, yeah. You know, because uh, I thought the three was with him, you know. I didn't know what they might do if I had said no. So I went on down to um, the back of the cat, and he was pouring the kerosene, you know. And so he told me to run, and he had already pulled on the other side of the street, and he just threw a match, and it struck up, and I was going, you know. And then on the, on the other side of the street, I, I was wondering which way to go, and this man was coming behind the cat, like, you know. And I asked him, what was he looking at, you understand? And um, he lied and said, I said something else, something, I don't know. And so the other guy lit the other side of the street, the thing. And I just started running, you know. And I got on the other street, and I just stopped, you know. I said, I ain't Dean, I'm wondering what the hell I'm running for. So um, as I was walking across the street, this guy in the Cadillac pointed me out to the police. The police got the car and went to searching me. And um. He didn't find nothing but some lunch tickets I had in my pocket, you know. He didn't find no matches or nothing. And um, he, he, he put me in the car and smelled my hands, and wasn't no, it wasn't any kerosene smell, only gasoline smell at all, you know. And so uh, he still took us downtown. And the cop made me stand up, and I pulled the hat over my head, and one, catch, one cop slapped the hat off my head, you know. I started to hit him, you know, but uh, I was thinking about it later on, you know, when I get in court, what, what they might say, you know, I was resisting. We got out of town, and uh, the cop told me, asked me, he asked me something, I, I didn't hear the, whatever he said, and I asked him, I said, huh? And he said, you want me to take him off? And I said, yeah, I want you to take him off. And he came over and hit me in the stomach, you know. Well, then I started to drag off and hit him back, you know. But I was still thinking about resisting, because every time they picked me up, you know, I had fought with the police, you know. This time I thought I'd take it a little, you know, easier. But um, anyway, this other cop shelled me off in the cell and called me a monkey. And uh, I, I wanted to get him bad. I ran to, I, I, I went to the, I tried to push the door open, but he, he, he had cracked a little bit, and I tried to push the door open to get at him, but he closed it up, you know. And so they, they came in, and, and uh, they came in, you know, when they had when they hit me in the stomach, they came in and pulled my clothes off me, you know. Then threw an old jumpsuit in there, you know. Well, he had, when he had, one one cop had his feet in my back. I forgot to men, forget not to mention that he had his feet in my back when he was taking the handcuffs off. And uh, it, they, I was on the floor, you know. And then uh, I put on that old jumpsuit to keep warm. And then I then I fell down. And then next thing, next I fell off the bench. And next thing I know was morning, and two cops came in there, you know, and asked me for a statement, you know, and I told them what happened. But they didn't want to hear about what the cops had did. They only didn't want to hear about my experience on the streets. They didn't want to hear about what the cops had did up there. So I went over to the, um, they took me over to Juvenile Hall. A nice cop took me over there, and then um, they booked me in over there. I had a feeling I wasn't coming home because even quit my job to come to come come back to school, you know. Probably if I hadn't quit my job, I wouldn't have been in no stuff now. But uh, I quit my job and came on back to school, tried to get the diploma. I don't know what they're gonna try to do. The cops will think of something, you know. They'll think of something. I'm not a loser, but the people trying to make it that way uptown, you know. But uh, they can't uh, they can't do it. Not if I don't want them to. They ain't gonna put me in no hole. Not even in this hole. Oh, you look terrible. I won't even give you a comb to comb your head. You know that's lousy. There's some damn lousy cops, that's all.
follow-up report on welfare case S2614 Agnes Johns, October 1966. Recommendation for monthly budget cut from 392 to 350 due to the detention of one of the children formerly living in the household. Okay, fellas, line it up. March down to your rooms. Remain there till I let you out. Okay, move out. That's the point. Seventeen-year-old Robert Johns is being held by juvenile authorities on a charge of arson. He will be given a hearing and, if found guilty, may, under the provisions of California law, be kept at state facilities until he reaches age 23. This has been NET Journal, a weekly report on people, issues, and events.